Hello, STAT students. All right, just to confuse things a little further, we are starting Chapter 3 in our textbook, but this actually is the second unit in the AP curriculum framework. Uh, so if you're looking on the AP classroom website, this is the start of Unit 2. I know, it'd be nice if everything lined up perfectly, but it doesn't. So in Chapter 3, we're going to be exploring two variable quantitative data. We had been only exploring one variable data. Moving on to two. And again, a, a couple of topics that might seem familiar to you. And then, of course, we're going to extend it beyond that. So for Section 3.1, we're referring to scatter plots and correlation. So uh, just FYI, this is from the Starnes and Tabor 6E updated edition of the Practice of Statistics. And we have a bunch of learning targets today. This lesson is going to be split up into two days. So I will try to remember to tell you where that split is. So we have to differentiate between what is known as a univariate and bivariate data. So if you look at those prefix where, uh, prefixes of the words, we got uni meaning one, bi meaning two. So a one variable data set, data set is called a univariate data. And then a, obviously a two variable data set could be called a bivariate data. So once in a while, those vocab terms will come up on your AP um, exam, and I didn't want you to be unfamiliar with those. So moving along, uh, the analysis of relationships between two variables builds on the same tools we use for one variable. So that's what's kind of nice about math in general, and stats is no um, stranger to this, that we build upon things that we already know. We just keep growing and growing. So we're going to be plotting the data, which is just like we did in, var in one variable, look for the overall patterns, and then look for any departure of those patterns, you know, outliers and weird things that happen. We're going to figure out some numerical summaries that are going to look a little different. And then when there is a regular overall pattern, we're going to use a simplified model to describe it. And then what's cool, I think, about this chapter is it starts leading you into um, interpolation and extrapolation, which I, you know, not to bore anybody as a child, I thought that was really crazy and wild. I think building models is one of the coolest things we can do in math and statistics in particular. So, um, you know, vocab, it's important. They're going to use terms like explanatory and response variables, which I think we did kind of uh, sneak in to chapter four when we started our curriculum this year. So we're going to be, uh, we talked about the studies, examine data on more than one variable, and we're going to have both types of variables here. So the analysis of relationships between two variables builds on the same tools. Okay, I just feel like I just read that, didn't I? Come on up, Ruzo, get with it. All right, so to remind you, a response variable measures the outcome of a study, and the explanatory variable may help predict or explain the changes in the response variable. So if you want to correlate, that's a bad use of that word today, Bruzo. Uh, if you want to connect that to an idea that you already know, remember that the explanatory variable would traditionally go along our x-axis, so it is our independent variable, and the response variable would go on the y-axis, and it is our uh, output or our dependent variable. In many studies, the goal is to show that changes in one or more explanatory variables actually cause the change in the response variable. However, other explanatory response relationships don't involve direct causation. We know this. We know that we have to be careful about saying something caused something else. So a scatter plot. I know you've seen scatter plots before. They show the relationship and possibly association between two quantitative variables measured on the same individuals. So the value of one variable appears on the horizontal axis, that would be the explanatory, and then the value of the other variable, um, the response variable, would go on the vertical axis. Each individual in the data set appears at a point, so it's just going to be a bunch of points they are not connected. It's a scatter plot. So the most important thing is you have to label the axes. Don't make this beautiful scatter plot with nothing written along the sides with any sort of explanation as to what they are. That would definitely lose points on an AP test and my test. So the explanatory variable, notice the X, that's how I remember it, goes along the horizontal or X axis. The response variable goes on the vertical. Um, if there is no explanatory variable, either variable can go on the horizontal axis. Interesting. <laughs> Scale the axes. So pay attention to how you're scaling them. You don't want to mislead anybody because of the way your graph looks. And then plot each individual data values. So I'm not going to make you make too many scatter plots by hand because they're pretty boring, frankly. Um, 
to describe a scatter plot, this is where it gets really interesting. How do we describe it? So we're going to follow some basic strategies of data analysis from chapter one, where we look for patterns and departures from those patterns. So two variables have a positive association when above average values of one variable tend to accompany above average values of the other. So basically, as one goes up, the other goes up. Two variables have a negative association when above average values of one accompany a below average value of the other. So to put it in simpler terms, as one variable goes up, the other variable will go down. There is no association between the variables if knowing the value of one variable does not help you predict the variable of the other. So if there's no discernible pattern, then we're going to say there's no association. So here's some examples of that. And what a lot of people do is they draw like a, an oval type thing around the dots um, and then they kind of squint. <laughs> so maybe right off the bat you notice that this had a positive correlation or association um, and this one has negative and then this one's just like a blob, no direction whatsoever. So this would be no association. If we were in class I'd quiz you on that like out loud but here we are. Positive, negative, no. So how to describe a scatter plot? So it's not good enough just to say it's a positive association. There's more things we have to address. So there's actually four characteristics, and they're going to give you a cute acronym at the end of this. Direction. So that's what we just talked about, positive, negative, or none. Form, meaning linear or nonlinear. Now, we won't specify anything beyond nonlinear right now, but later on we will see that there's other types of um, you know, scatter plot so we might notice a pattern that um, we could differentiate between other things. So that'd be fun. <laughs> so either linear or nonlinear, that's it. And then strength, which we're going to classify as weak, moderate, or strong. Um, if association is strong, if the points don't deviate much from the form identified. So if it looks like a line and it is a stinking solid line, um, you know, you don't have to use your imagination to determine that it's a line, it would have a strong correlation. But if it really just looks like a line, if you squint really hard, then you might say it's got a weak correlation and then moderate would be something in the middle. Now, don't confuse weak association with no association. No association is like there is no discernible pattern. It doesn't look like a line at all. All right, unusual features, um, you know, what you might think of as an outlier. But here we're actually looking for things like not just something that falls outside of that pattern, but also clusters. You might see a cluster at the beginning of what looks like a line and also at the end. So when describing association, make sure you write it in the context of the problem. That's going to be really, really important for us. Both variable names have to be in that problem, okay, in your description. So here we are looking at a scatter plot where they compared the percent of, what do we got here, students who took the SAT and their mean math score. Okay. So, cool, cool. Describe the association. So remember, we got those four descriptors, and I don't think they showed us the cute acronym yet. So they say DUFS, D-U-F-S, which the first time I saw it, I thought it said doofus. I'm going to 100% honest, thought it said doofus, and I was like, doofus, that's cute. Yeah, they, they wanted DUFS. So however you want to remember that, go ahead. Uh, so what they're claiming here is that we have, and they're going to call this moderately strong, negative, and then they call it a curved relationship. Um, oh, that kind of totally contradicts what I just told you guys, huh? Sorry about that. Uh, so they weren't going to go as far as to say it was linear. And for those of you who have some uh, memory of your algebra lives before this, this almost looks like someone could say it's like exponential, like a decay. We're not going to go that far right now. Um, but notice here, this is the next part that's crucial. Between the percent of students in a state who take the SAT and the mean math SAT score. So notice the context there. That's what I wanted you to focus on. Um, and then they go further to talk about if there's anything strange happening. It says there are two distinct clusters of states. So they're claiming that like here's a cluster, there's a gap, and then here's a cluster. Um, and two unusual points that fall outside of the overall pattern. So this guy right here and this guy right here I think is who they're claiming are unusual. Notice they didn't actually state which points were unusual. That would be the next step in your um, 
identification of what you're trying to figure out here. For now, we're going to keep it pretty vague. But the important thing here is that they hit all four things. Uh, the duffs, <laughs> the direction, the strength, um, the unusual pieces, and uh, I forget what the F stands for all of a sudden. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking. Thank you. Form, hello. And again, that is where I kind of misled you on the previous slide. I apologize for that. They did went ahead. They did go ahead and say this had a curved relationship. For us on a test, um, I'll be honest, I'm probably just going to stick to linear relationships for you guys. I don't panic. Oh, man, I am so impatient. I need to think about my slides a little more. Look at that. Highlighted and color coded and everything. Moderately strong, negative curved, um, and then it talks about the unusual pieces, and then the context is in the middle there. All right, let's try this all on our own. Oh, this problem is after my heart. It's about candy. So they want to know is there a relationship between the amount of sugar and the number of cal calories in the candy? Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't think I need the study to tell me that, but that's okay. Let's do it anyways. So they want to first, and this is a check your understanding, so you're going to want to pause the video and answer these three questions yourself, but identify the explanatory and response variables and explain your reasoning. Make a scatter plot to display the relationship. I'll be honest, I don't know if you want to take the time to make the scatter plot by hand, I understand, but you're going to have a hard time telling me number three if you don't see a scatter plot. So uh, decide what you want to do with that, pause the video, and let's see how you did. Okay, so for the solutions, they went with the explanatory variable being the amount of sugar, and then the response variable being the number of calories. And the explanation for that was that they were trying to claim that the amount of sugar either explains or predicts the number of calories in the uh, movie theater candy. Now, I suppose someone could argue the inverse of that, but I don't know that you'd want to. All right, so number two is the scatter plot. So they went ahead and plotted each one of those ordered pairs using sugar as the x coordinate and calories as the y coordinate. This is a little tedious to do by hand. Don't worry, we're going to show you how to do it in the calculator in a minute. And then from that picture, which we do need, we can see that there is a moderately strong positive linear relationship. Now, you may be looking at this going, eh, I don't know that I consider that moderately strong. Maybe you thought it was a weak positive linear relationship. Um, we're going to give you a way to figure that answer out in a, in a little bit of this lesson, a little further on. Um, but for now, for, oops, back up. For now, we'll go with what the book said. Now look at the underlined part. This is the context between the amount of sugar contained in the movie theater candy and the number of calories in the candy. And then they talk about some unusual pieces. The point, and they got real specific, which I like. The point for peanut M&Ms, which is 79 grams of sugar, has 790 calories. That's this guy right here. That's an unusual point. If we kind of took that out, then it might be a little more linear. The strength might be a little better. Um, and then that fact also makes me very sad because I think, man, I do love peanut M&Ms. And then the logical part of my brain says, and again, I'm not going to do causation here, but peanut M&Ms, not only do they have the delicious sugar coating, they also have a peanut in the middle, which peanuts, as yummy as they are and healthy as they are traditionally, when they're coated in sugar, not so much. Peanuts have a lot of fat and therefore calories in them. So, yeah, that made me more depressed than I thought it would. Okay, technology corner. So we don't like making scatter plots by hand. I get it. Me neither. We can do it on the calculator. So it's very important we get a picture of our scatter plot so we can answer those questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some data, and here they want us to go to the book, to page 155, and construct a scatter plot using that data, which I don't think I have in here anywhere, but basically it's you'll see it starting with, looks like 103. So um, enter your variables for uh, payroll values into list one. Make sure you go in the exact order that you're reading them. And then their corresponding y, whoops, y values into L2, which represent the number of wins. Okay, my, I hope you can't hear my kid upstairs. I swear they're having fun. They just sound like elephants. All right, once we get that data entered into list one and list two, pause the video for yourself to do that. And then we're going to move on and we're going to look at the distribution, the scatter plot, by turning on our plot. 
So I'm going to go to second y equals. I'm going to turn on plot one. And for the type, I'm going to choose the first type that says scatter plot. It's very important that you make sure your data is being pulled from the right list. So my X's were in list one and my Y's were in list two. If you happen to enter them backwards, you can just reverse them. Choose whatever mark you want, choose whatever color you want. And then of course, we're gonna have to set up our window, which I'm just gonna cheat and do zoom stat. And you'll see that picture. So AP exam tip here says, if you're asked to make a scatter plot, be sure to label and scale the axes. Don't just copy what is on the calculator directly under your paper um, without labels, because you will notice when it's zoom stats, it's kind of hard to tell here, but see how like dark this is? I can tell that the scales for the X and Y are probably real weird. <laughs> so what you're gonna wanna do is go to window and figure out what they did. Um, and make sure that you have scaled and also labeled the, the axes. Remember X represented payroll or something like that? Yeah, payroll values, you wanna put a label on that, I'm guessing it's dollars. Um, and then the number of wins along the Y axes. All right, blue box means that this is the end of day one's lesson. If you're looking for day two, uh, it's the next part. All right, so for day two in our lesson, we're going to be measuring linear association through correlation. So earlier in the lesson, I said, you know, oh, hey, maybe you thought it was moderately strong, or sorry, moderately linear, um, and maybe your neighbor thought it was weak and linear, and you were having a bit of a disagreement over that. Well, now we're going to give you something that you could, you or your calculator can calculate that'll help you kind of support that fact, and that's correlation. So a scatter plot displays direction, form, strength of a relationship between two quantitative variables. When the association between two quantitative variables is linear, we can use the correlation R. So this is why I was really focused on linear correlation um, and relationships. So linear and nonlinear basically for us in this lesson. The correlation factor only comes into play if you have a linear relationship. So we saw an example earlier in the lesson where it was like curved and it was not linear. So we wouldn't be able to use this correlation idea on that picture. And it's gonna help us describe that strength and direction. So for linear associations between two quantitative variables, the correlation, which they call R, I have no idea why, there are several R's in that word, but whatever, uh, measures the direction and strength. Okay, that's gonna help. It is only appropriate to use correlation to describe strength and direction of linear relationships. Highlight that. All right, so some facts about R. It is between negative one and one, and that can include negative one and one. So anything including negative one and one, anything in between it. Oh my gosh, you have to be able to hear those elephants. I'm so sorry, I feel like yelling at them. All right, the correlation R indicates the direction by the sign. So if it's greater than zero, you have a positive association. And if it's less than zero, you have a negative association. So some people say, oh great, I don't even have to look at the scatter plot. Eh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> because sometimes you have a correlation um, value that is very misleading. So we'll talk about that later. Maybe we'll run into it. The extreme values. So if you have actually get negative one or one, that would only occur if you have a perfectly linear relationship. You might have something that is real close, like a 0.998 and it's gonna look really stinking linear with just like a little bit of deviation on it, um, but it won't be perfect. It's only perfect if your correlation comes out to a one or negative one. Negative one would be negatively perfect. And then the linear relationship is strong. If it is strong, excuse me, it'll be closer to one or negative one. So a lot of kids compare this to slope and the idea is similar to slope because we're looking at lines, right? So a positive, one slope in their mind means a strong positive correlation and a negative one slope in their minds means a strong negative correlation. That's an okay way to think of it. Now, if you have a weak relationship um, or possibly no relationship, then you're gonna have correlation will be close to zero. So we'll try to do an activity where you guys can try to guess the correlation later. So right here, this has no correlation, guys. This is a blob. <laughs> now here, if you squint, you can tell there's a bit of a negative like look to it. It's not great though. So this is a correlation factor of negative 
and notice it was a negative slope, if you want to think of it that way. This one has a positive relationship, but it's not very strong. It's a 0.5er. This one is a little stronger than the weak ones we've been seeing. Um, it is definitely negative. You might say this is a moderately negative linear association. There we go. That's a good one. Positive and I would say strong positive linear association. Whoa! <laughs> negative 0.99. That is nearly perfect, right? So this is a, you can even go as far as to say very strong negative uh, linear association. All right, check our understanding. So we have scatter plots that show the 40 yard dash times in seconds and long jump distances in inches labeled beautifully, of course, from a small class of 12 students. The correlation for this data is negative 0.838. Interpret what that means. So pause the video, jot down some thoughts. Let's see how you did. So the correlation of r equals negative 0.838, it confirms, and the confirm part is because we're looking at the picture thinking, man, that looks negative. Um, it confirms that we have a linear association between dash time and long distance jump. There's your context. They're saying it's also strong and negative. Now, I think we can all get on board with the negative. Maybe while looking at that picture, you weren't sure if it was strong or not. But the fact that the correlation factor came out to like, if you want to think of it as a grade, like an 84%, um, that is why they're claiming it is strong. I almost feel like they need to give you guys a, a, some parameters. So think of it as grades. You know, if you have an 80 something percent, that's a pretty strong grade, right? If you're getting down to like 60%, 70%, a little less strong. Um, and again, this is really, a, it, they haven't give you, given you like a boundary line for what is considered strong and moderate. So I'll be honest on my test, I'm gonna make them really obvious. Um, just don't get them confused, I guess. All right, some cautions about correlation. Correlation does not imply causation. Okay, it does not imply causation. Now that candy example we had before, how like, you know, why do these candies have more calories? Is it because of the amount of sugar in them? Well, yeah, probably by definition, candy has a lot of calories because it's like almost 100% sugar. Um, but you know, more information is needed, more experimentation is needed to, to really figure that out. Although I think we all can agree that candy has a lot of calories for that very reason. Correlation does not measure form. Okay, so correlation, if you got like a 0.96, that doesn't mean you necessarily have a linear association. So it's very important that you first look at the scatter plot before you go and say what kind of form you have. Correlation should only be used when describing linear relationships. The correlation is misleading when you have something that's not linear because the correlation coefficient will pop up in your screens of your calculator regardless as to whether it's linear or not. So we got to just be careful. Correlation is not resistant a measure of strength. So that means if you have some unusual numbers, some outliers, it's going to change your correlation. Your data won't be fitting as well as it could. You know, we talked about, man, I keep going back to that candy example. Um, those peanut M&Ms seem, seem to be an unusual number. So if you took that out, how does that change your correlation? All right. Now this one, this is enough to give you nightmares, this next screen that I'm going to show you. <laughs> so it's telling you how do you calculate the correlation factor of R? Well, if we have data on variables X and Y for a certain number of individuals, the values for the first individual are X1, Y1, the second would be X2, Y2, and so on and so on. The means and the standard deviations of those two variables are known as X bar and S sub X. So uh, I don't know how well we covered this earlier in this year, but X bar is the mean of the sample and S sub X is the standard deviation of the sample. Okay, I know it gets, gets confusing here because we, we've been throwing mu and sigma in there too. Anywho, um, for those X values. And then Y bar and S sub Y are the mean for the Y values and the standard deviation for the Y values. So the correlation is calculated by that. Well, sure. That's just great. <laughs> All right. So this is the long-handed formula, and this is how they tried to like make it simpler, and frankly, they're both crazy. 
So just to kind of pull this apart for you, x minus a, a mean over a standard deviation, isn't that just a z-score? And then this is the y value, the corresponding y value z-score. So basically they're multiplying their z-scores together and then they're adding all those together. That's what this sigma means to add them up. And then when you divide by one over n minus one, I think in class we've talked about this more, um, but if you divide by n, basically you're adding them all up and dividing by n, you're averaging the products of the z-scores. We'll talk more in class about this, but when you divide by n minus one, um, you're just making your number more statistically sound because you're dividing by a smaller number and therefore giving you yourself a little wiggle room um, because that gives you, a, it overestimates the number that you're about to calculate. So that way you're not underestimating by accident. All right, anywho, um, I know you guys are like, I'm ready to quit this class, but it's too late. Here's some good news. I'm not gonna make a hand calculate correlation. <laughs> Like, I don't think the the AP exam will ever have you hand calculate it. I don't know why they would. You know, now that I've said that, they probably will. But you know what, guys, if that shows up on a multiple choice question, and for some reason you can't use your calculator on that question, just make a guess and move on. You have your teacher's permission. All right, so it's, let's, it's way more important to know um, how to interpret the correlation rather than how to calculate it. So don't get hung up on that formula. Let's talk about R a little bit more. Correlation requires that both of your variables are quantitative, so they both have to be numerical. It makes no distinction between explanatory and response variables. Okay. R does not change when we change the units of measure for X or Y or both. So if you were originally measuring in feet and changed it to meters, does not matter. The correlation is going to be the same. The correlation R has no unit of measure. It is just simply a number. It's a comparative number. So we can decide, um, you know, how, what kind of association we have. The strength of the association and the learning targets. Woo! That means we're done. So correlation, again, don't get hung up on how to calculate R. There's never a moment that I will make you independently calculate R. It is just not a thing we want to do in, in stats class. So don't get stressed out about that. The important thing is, can you interpret R? Can you tell me what kind of association, you know, what strength? Um, are there any unusual factors? What form does it have? I forgot one of them. Uh, what did I forget? Oh my gosh, I need a poster, guys. I need a poster. All right. <laughs> I forgot what, I already forgot what I just said. This is why I need to teach lessons with children. Anywho. Uh, your teacher needs a nap. That's what that's what has to happen here. I'm gonna go yell at my children. You guys enjoy your stats. Have a good day.